Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Budapest. It's my homeland after all, but I live in Los Angeles. I spend most of my time uh, working for UCLA and teaching biochemistry medicine or biochemistry there. Uh, <clears throat> so my goal is by the end of my talk, you're going to understand the title. Um, it's a little complicated, and there are uh, very many new developments. Uh, and I, I'd like to give you an update of the scientific and the basic um, new information and knowledge in the deuterium uh, field and obviously it's all or mostly related to mitochondrial uh, physiology and biochemistry and, and I'm just gonna uh, get on to the topic. So um, I'm gonna talk about the source of metabolic protons and metabolic water. Um, this has been a obscurity uh, you know for, for a long time why deuterium has such a strong, profound effect on uh, biochemistry and, and on health in general. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, lipid membranes and in interactions with protons and deuterons. Now, this is a very new development because uh, a few months, a few weeks ago, actually, there was a paper out from uh, investigators from Saudi Arabia <coughs> and, and from the uh, University of San uh, California, San Diego, showing that actually protons interact with uh, hydrophobic surfaces, surfaces, and those are very characteristic of membranes, especially in the mitochondria because of the tight compartmentalized water structure. I'm going to talk about this uh, quantum destabilization of water or protons, which is a new phenomenon that, that is entering the field. And I'm going to talk about how, why uh, the above processes are compromised by deuterium in biology. And there are medical, medical applications. I'm going to give you some updated information about uh, basic scientific studies that are currently uh, carried out at UCLA and, and elsewhere. So um, to actually kind of show you how to take uh, mitochondria into context, uh, I have to take you on a very short journey, it's, it's only a few micrometers. Uh, here's the cell membrane with the double uh, lipid layers. There are uh, proteins that are embedded in this layer, and this is the cell membrane. And as we go deeper um, into the cells, uh, you can see this is an animation from, uh, I believe, the University of uh, Oxford, uh, uh, and I got it from the internet. Now, he, here are mitochondria, which have their own uh, uh, membrane structures. And here you can see how these mitochondria are, are water compartments and you know biochemical compartments in the cell. And as, as we look at the mitochondrial membrane, especially the inner membrane, because mitochondria has two membranes, there are these nanomotors, these proteins that actually spin in the membrane. And this is practically how we generate uh, ATP. And these motors, these, these nanomotors, are driven by protons. And the protons come from food. And uh, <coughs> while ATP is synthesized by the shaft of this nanomotor, it's practically an engine. It's practically a motor. It's a hydrogen-powered um, uh, motor. There is a gradient, a uh, great uh, proton gradient um, along the two sides of the membrane. And as you can see, that the, the motor has uh, uh, a binding sites for protons. And the protons have to travel around. Uh, uh, with this end, with this little nanomotor, and they fall into the matrix, into the mitochondrial matrix, and we know what happens there to protons. They actually form water with the oxygen that we breathe in and out. So practically, this is an, a, a hydrogen-powered um, energy-producing system. Here you can see as ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, comes in, and it actually joins phosphate and uh, uh, ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is released. And this is the general currency of of uh, energy in cells. So ATP, by hydrolyzing the last uh, pr uh, phosphate, uh, would provide energy for cellular, various cellular processes, um, including uh, ion pumping, uh, protein synthesis, uh, macromolecule synthesis, cell divisions, and so on. Now, these membrane, or these motors, um, and I, I believe Dr. Ogun is going to give us uh, another uh, good perspective of, of these uh, uh, biochemical engines. And he published very really profound and very important papers how deuterium interacts with these nanomotors, how deuterium may break these nanomotors. But practically, when we close these membranes, you can see these nanomotors are still spinning, turning around. And we know their velocity or their rotation is, is very 
rapid. Uh, now we are moving out of the cell, and we can see the mitochondria again. And as we just leave the cells, this is practically the nanomotor ATP synthesis uh, machines uh, that we use for our, uh, for our cellular health. Now, we do know that deuterium, being twice as heavy, twice as large as, as uh, hydrogen, can break, scatter these nanomotors and can damage the protein structures, not only the nanomotors, but, but also uh, practically uh, all ma ma macromolecules that are engaged in our cellular functions, they can be changed physically, their, their physical characteristics can be changed by, um, uh, by uh, uh, deuterium. Now, this is just an overview of how mitochondria uh, look like and how they function. This is just a very schematic approach uh, of visualization, how it works. So practically, this is the citric acid cycle. It's the uh, send your job at Krebs cycle. We are in Hungary, so we say send your knee first because he clarified more of most of the reactions of the Krebs cycle. And Hans Krebs uh, clarified only two reactions, so we actually call it send your Krebs cycle in Hungary. But practically, it's the citric acid cycle when you look at its function. So it, it turns citric acid around, and by the uh, turnover of citric acid, there is a proton harvesting or hydrogen harvesting with uh, NAD, uh, NADH, reduced NAD would carry the protons to the cytochrome uh, proteins, and cytochromes would actually would strip the hydrogen from its uh, electrons, and, and the protons with a positive charge are uh, showered or transferred to the inner membrane space, and the hydrogens, as I showed you before in the previous uh, video, uh, have to come, hydrogens, protons have to come back uh, to the matrix, uh, and actually oxygen is waiting for hydrogen, is this is how metabolic water is produced. We call this metabolic water simply because we produce this water to metabolism. And um, th there's a, a great deal of understanding this system because of its dynamics, and uh, <coughs> obviously all the citric acid cycle providing the protons, oxygen carrying uh, uh, proteins like hemoglobin and oxygen transfer is important, and the metabolic water formation is key to understand the integrity of mitochondria, both from the functional and the, from, from the morphological point of view. And, uh, point of views. And, and obviously, if hydrogen is replaced by de de deuterons or deuterium, then this whole system is kinetically, is, is dramatically changed. Um, and now we understand this process uh, somewhat better simply because we are collaborating and working with investigators who actually replace some of these systems and the membranes uh, are getting into this uh, scenario very uh, strongly. So um, uh, the other place where, my, uh, where the other place where water is produced in our system from fatty acids, which we know are low in deuterium, are uh, the peroxisomes, and we know catalase will break the hydrogen peroxide that is produced in peroxisomes. And this is just a quick comparison of how mitochondria compared to peroxisomes. Peroxisomes use uh, dissolved oxygen in blood, and it, they use uh, long chain fatty acids. They not necessarily produce acetic enzyme, but they produce shorter chain fatty acids. So peroxisomes are involved in specific harvesting of low deuterium uh, carbon sites and fatty acids, especially unsaturated fatty acids. So actually, uh, peroxisome can uh, provide deuterium depleted water for the cells uh, as well, and catalase will actually break, cleave hydrogen peroxides and water is produced. Usually two molecules of hydrogen peroxide pro pro produces two uh, molecules of water and then oxygen and, and, and molecular oxygen is returned into the, into the serum as a dissolved oxygen. So practically when we look at metabolic pro water production is a very robust system in our cells <coughs> and uh, to actually understand how robust this system we have to do a little calculations for our own um, um, information and practically what I use here as a model I just calculated obviously uh, getting information from here. There's always links in the bottom. Uh, I'm, gonna have, uh, I'm gonna have a PDF of this presentation. You can click on these links. But first we kind of, uh, we're gonna approach this process simply looking at uh, uh, morphologically how many uh, 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 nanomotors there are in the system in, in our mitochondria. And we can see that actually every 10 nanometers in certain locations there are nanomotors sitting. 
and in, in a, uh, about uh, each side of the uh, crypt of the, of the mitochondria, there are about 8,000 nanometers. And if you add up the crypts, the number of crypts, the, the cristae, the number of nanometers, uh, we come up with a huge number. There are about 300, uh, 320,000 nanometers in each mitochondria. So actually, there is a lot of engines, a lot of motors running there, and they run around 3,000 and average rotations per minute, <coughs> and they bind about uh, 9 to 12 uh, protons each uh, uh, for each rotation. Uh, so practically, this is a huge number of, of uh, proton transferring uh, and nanomotors. Um, and if you look at how many mitochondria there are in cells, uh, we can count liver cells, they have about 2,000 mitochondria per cell, and in muscle cells there is about 1,500 mitochondria. Uh, college skin cells and connective tissues, they have uh, about 200 mitochondria. mitochondria. So for, for, as an average calculation, we use 1,000 as an average. Again, these calculations are more like in the ballpark, so nobody knows exactly, truthfully, how many there are, but you can always look at uh, um, the numbers based on the links that I provided, so you can do your own calculations as well. Um, so now we have to figure out how many cells we have. Uh, we know a single cell weighs about one nanogram, and we have about, uh, it's, 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 it's 10 to minus nine uh, gram. A dog man weighs about 70 kilograms, so if you look at these links and do the calculations, you can find out that we actually have every human being, every human being would have about 70 trillion cells, which is about 70 times 10 to the 12. Now, for calculations, we use 35 trillion. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. You can read the details, but practically it's in that range. Uh, the, the 35 times 10 to the 12, that's how many cells we have. So after all, if we multiply how many cells we have, 35 trillions, about 1,000 mitochondria in cells, 320,000 nanometers, then we can figure in e each second we transfer about 1.1 1.12 times 10 to the 22nd proton uh, in an average human body, which is which weighs about 70 kilograms, and uh, you know practically these nanomotors transfer uh, 9 to 12 protons uh, each time they turn around. We use an average of 3,000 rotations per minute. Um, there are nanomotors that are spinning about 40,000 rotations per minute. They found a bacteria which really rapidly turns these nanomotors around. Um, we, uh, we know at, at maximum velocity, Dr. Andrew Zomberg published a paper from Germany, um, uh, or cited a paper where they calculated like at maximum velocity, ATP synthase nanomotors spin about 9,000 rotations per minute. These are like Formula One race cars. I mean, these are really uh, rapidly spinning pr uh, proteins, but that practically for the calculations, we use 3,000 rotations per minute. And this is what uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Zomer was shown that uh, metabolic or actually surface water is very um, precisely interacts with nanomotor functions and actually laser, uh, red, uh, uh, soft laser lights actually make water less viscous. And this, this was published actually in Nature Scientific Reports. It's actually a, a very interesting paper because it shows that if, if with laser light you can actually make uh, interfacial water in mitochondria, uh, you know, in the interpretation less viscous and actually it speeds up. It actually makes these nanomotors to, to spin faster. And uh, truthfully, when we just look at the average numbers and we just add up these numbers, after all, we come up with that every, with the number that every day, every human being would transfer about 4.83 times 10 to the 29 protons. That's a lot of protons, practically. It's 29 zeros after the 4.8 and these are the ballpark calculations. I'm not going to go into details. You're going to have this talk um, posted in, in the conference website. Now, to find out how much water equivalent protons this is, uh, we just have to find out how many, in, in the molar term or molarity, how many uh, water molecules it means. It's, it, it actually means about uh, 4,100,000 uh, more water. Uh, again, um, it, it has a, uh, we know that practically what's the molecular weight of, of, of uh, water, it's 18 grams, and it means practically every human being, every human being transfer about 72, uh, 7,231 liters of metabolic protons uh, equivalent of metabolic water, which is about 2,000 gallons a day. 
I mean, this is a variable system. Um, so practically looking at the dynamics of our energy producing and proton transferring system, this is a very, very robust and a very um, an efficient system of trans transferring protons and generating water if water is generated, not necessary. I'm gonna go into details a little bit. But yet, this is actually a very um, robust system that is adapted to the circulation. Um, so if you look at the um, how and why humans are able to, and you know, mammalian cells are able to transfer so many protons, um, the human heart circulates the same amount of water a day. And it's recalculated practically by looking at the five, six liters of blood we have in our system. And each minute we turn it over because our heart rate is about 65, 85. It's between 65, 85 heartbeats per minute. And our ejection fraction, which we call practically just, uh, that's the volume of, of, of ejecting uh, uh, blood in the, from the blood is 70 milliliters at each uh, systolic uh, uh, phase or, or contraction, contraction of the heart muscle. So if you look at uh, how many uh, uh, water we pump, uh, how many blood, how much water, uh, blood we pump a minute, it's about five liters. So we end up there, if we calculate how many um, minutes there are in the day, it's again comes up with 7,200 liters. So uh, 7,200 uh, uh, liters, which is 7,200 liters, it's about 2,000 gallons. So our circulation seems, and metabolic water pr or proton transfer is in equilibrium, or a stoichiometric uh, equilibrium with, with uh, metabolism. This is how our system works. We practically need oxygen from the environment to turn protons over, and these systems are in, in equilibrium, or actually they can, um, uh, as they depend on each other, they have a volumetric uh, equivalence. So practically, uh, this is a uh, corresponding system as far as oxygen consumption and, and proton transfer. This is why we actually measure oxygen consumption when we actually want to look at someone's uh, uh, metabolic uh, uh, rate. Um, now, how can we produce and recycle so much water? It's because of the TC cycle. The TCA cycle has 10 reactions and uh, uh, four of the nine reactions and four of those nine reactions, so almost half of the reactions those do nothing but practically recycle water from the mitochondrial matrix. So uh, uh, fumarate hydratase, uh, um, citrate synthase, uh, conitase, which is a conic acid, conic acid hydratase, and isocitrate dehydrogenase, those are all water recycling enzymes. Practically, they add or rearrange water uh, in a TC cycle uh, metabolites, intermediate metabolites. And uh, usually my students at UCLA, they don't like me because this is a lot of enzymatic reactions. So practically, I have to tell them, you know, guys, actually the purpose of these reactions is recycle water and the rest of the reaction would you arrange carbons in the way that actually those, those uh, protons can be harvested these from these metabolites and you can see these water signs those are all water entries and water ex uh, um, uh, afflux from from the tc saco and in the meantime these uh, protons are harvested and NADH is produced, and this is the cycle practically, not only TC cycle, but there's also a proton recycling process in the form of water. So this is a very robust system. We know this flux is very intense. We know these fluxes are very co-regulated with ATP synthase, for example, uh, for the manic acid dehydrogenase, it also uses the same uh, uh, um, uh, amino acid side chain to bind protons. So the human proton ratio in matrix water is very much a strong regulator of the dynamics of these enzy enzyme kinetics and, and these uh, structural um, uh, characteristics of mitochondria. Now, protons are practically get absorbed. And again, um, there are some new developments before we actually go into, uh, I'm not gonna go into m much more details, but practically understand the robustness of the system requires some, some further collaboration, um, uh, considerations. ATP synthesis and ATP hydrolysis uh, requires water turnover. I'm not gonna go into details of that. Uh, during uh, strenuous exercise, ATP turnover can reach about half kilogram per minute. That's actually a lot of um, ATP and, and, and water recycling. 
um, ATP production and de de degradation can re in, in athletes can actually uh, reach their body weight. And when we actually calculate how much water is, there is, an, uh, there is another like nine liters of water in athletes that is getting recycled through ATP synthesis. Here's the scheme. Here's an ATP molecule. Here's a phosphate, the hydroxyl groups coming in. And it joins the ATP chain and water uh, is expelled uh, from uh, ATP, ATP and then ATP, uh, ATP is produced. So this water is constantly recycled because when uh, uh, ATP gets hydrolyzed, it, it uses a molecule of water. So, and we know 20.5 kilojoules per more energy is exchanged in the process. So just to summarize the first part of my talk, uh, we do know that, in fact, oxygen delivery and metabolic proton water recycling on various sources are very robust processes in humans and, in fact, every living being. Uh, life is nothing else but producing and breaking water. So practically, to make this a, a physiological, medically relevant field, we have to kind of grab, have a kind of a grip of how strong, how robust the system is, and to understand and appreciate fully the uh, influence of, of deuterium of, with this process is practically is not only the isotopic differences between hydrogen and deuterium, but also the robustness of the system that have to deal with the isotope effects of hydrogen, uh, of deuterium. Now, water has many other characteristics. It's not just drinking water. Practically, there are many forms and many different uh, ways water is handled. Uh, in, in nature, uh, there's adhesion of water, there's water that climbs up on the side of a glass tube to try to dissolve the glass practically so protons can interact with the surrounding. There's also uh, cohesion of water, so water molecules slide, they like to stick together and practically the, the proton uh, hydrogen, hydrogen interactions um, are very important <coughs> in the process. So practically water can actually hang on a spider web. And it's practically because of its surface energies and surface tension. So cohesion of water and, and adhesion of water, those are all phys physical properties that are uh, mediated mostly uh, uh, by deuterium hydrogen ratios. And we know hydrogen, how deuterated water has different viscosity, different boiling temperature. I'm not going to talk about this because you guys know about those uh, in details. And we're going to have he hemo talks uh, tomorrow. So I'm not going to kind of uh, um, get into that field, but practically all these physics, in, in, all these interactions are very much dependent on, um, on uh, the hydrogen and deuterium ratios of, of water, of light water or heavy water. Now, uh, this is a, a, a very new development and this paper was published about two weeks ago, uh, which I'm gonna talk about in more details. It's called the quantum destabilization of water or protons, and this paper came out from uh, the University of uh, California, San Diego, and with collaboration with uh, uh, University of Saudi Arabia. But in the 1980s, there was an unexpected property discovered of water, and that was practically nothing else, but when you actually were moving too hydrophobic, so two surfaces that are not really liking water too much, it's actually the shot water. When you were moving two hydrophobic surfaces slowly uh, together at a certain distance, these two surfaces kind of jump together, which people did not understand really truly what it is. Uh, it was practically just an unexpected finding. Why would actually two surfaces, when they come close to each other, actually attach to each other when they are close in water and they are like magnet, they kind of stick together. Um, and uh, this was noted in the 1980s. They did not understand for a very long time. So the, the colleague in Saudi Arabia, he was uh, uh, calling meetings on various uh, experts, uh, physicists, and so on. And uh, uh, obviously, this was something that needed to be explored because there was no explanation for that. We, we're going to uh, find an explanation by the end. Uh, the nuclear quantum effects of hydrophobic non-confinement is the title of the paper. It's published in the Journal of Physical Chemistry. It's a letter form, and it's just it just got published a few uh, few weeks ago. Um, um, so this is what happens. This is a, um, a quantum nature of bulk waters, hydrogen atoms. This is uh, two surfaces moved uh, together, and there's a um, uh, water bulk water layer between them. And if you bring them about 
two to four nanometers in uh, proximity, they actually jump together, they stick together. They are like magnets, they are pulled towards each other. And by measuring <coughs> the force between the two surfaces, hydrophobic surfaces, you can actually compare these physical forces based on water temperature, water solvent capacity, and so on. And interestingly, uh, when you look at these, uh, uh, these surfaces as, as you move them together, if you repeat this experiment in deuterium in heavy water, in deuterium in rich water, this phenomenon is not as intense. So practically deuter deuterium disrupts this, this uh, um, uh, quantum destabilization of water. So if you compare e every parameter, I'm not going to go into details, there are physics, there's actually force between these two plates that are pulling them together. In deuterium, in deuterium uh, heavy water, it's about 10% lower. We are talking about bulk water. It's about 10% lower than in uh, uh, light water, and so it is uh, the normalized uh, adhesion force. Practically, you can see this difference consistent in heavy water being decreased. And they could not explain why uh, thermodynamics like changing free energy and uh, changing entropy would be different in heavy water. Heavy water does not. So, so this is actually the distance of the two plates. You can see that it by nanom nan nanometers. There's if you come from, you can actually measure this about 10 uh, uh, nanometer, nanometers. And you can see as you come these with these plates, hydrophobic plates, uh, closer together at two na nanometers, this four, this difference is, is significantly uh, altered in heavy water. We are talking about bulk water, and the excess uh, zero point energy, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, that's the most dramatically uh, different between the two um, water uh, pools or the water compartments or water types, the heavy water, light water. So practically, the quantum energies and also the entropy is is uh, very different when you look at uh, in bulk water, uh, light water, and heavy water. Um, interestingly, entropy, so the, the organization of the system does not change uh, based on uh, deuterium or, or light water exposure of these hydrophobic surfaces. And here again, we make we get them closer to each other, and and you don't see that dramatic effect that I showed you in in, uh, in the previous slide. But practically, they uh, they started kind of guessing or explaining how these uh, forces uh, operate in in water compartments. Uh, Dr. Himanshu Mishra, who is uh, at uh, at the University of uh, uh, King Abdullah uh, in Tuwa, which is in Saudi Arabia, came up with the idea of comparing ordinary water with heavy water. So this was his initiative to compare the two water um, uh, types, heavy water, light water, to see how these forces uh, implement the, the system, how the, how the, the two water uh, type, uh, heavy and light water, uh, change the system. And me, as a medical you know, biochemist, the first question is that what does uh, this have to do with bi biology? Um, and we're, we're going to uh, hit that on a, uh, in a minute. Uh, and Todd Pascal, who is at the University of California, San Diego, so he's just a driving distance from us, um, he came up with the uh, uh, explanation. Actually, he measured the surface force between uh, uh, light water and heavy water, these hydrophobic surfaces. And he noted that there's a 10% dif difference uh, always at certain proximities. And obviously, the question is, what are the biological implications? Um, now, so th they came up with some quantum physics uh, type of explanations. And this is very interesting, because they were saying that um, the smaller a particle is, let's say a, 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 a proton, uh, it less strictly adheres to the laws of classical physics, and it's more subject of quantum effects. Now, we know the uncertain relations. I'm not going to go into details, but practically protons can behave in two ways. It can have a mass, a proton, or it can change into a waveform uh, um, a particle which does not have a mass anymore, and does not have pressure, and does not have a lot of physical characteristics that protons would have, and to that matter, what water would have that has uh, protons and oxygen. And it was the first question to these investigators. My question was that what are the mitochondrial implications? Because there are actually lipid membranes there, which are hydrophobic membranes. And if they are close proximity, they can actually do the same to protons. 
So practically, if the genome get into mitochondria and don't, don't respond to these quantum effects, then that's a disaster for, from the mitochondrial physiological uh, or biochemical point of views. So practically, we started discussing uh, these scenarios with these investigators, and I'm going to talk about uh, collaborations uh, in this field. And uh, you know, further explanations were just uh, taking this tiny hydrogen atom uh, and uh, consider it as a quantum object in, in, in their plates, in their uh, hydrophobic experiment. But to me, as a medicine of biochemist, that's a mitochondrial membrane that is also hydrophobic and the same distance as what they used, a few nanometers. And we, they know, they show that hydrogen behaves differently. It does not, it sometimes behaves like a particle, sometimes more like a wave at that distance of hydrophobic first, uh, surfaces, and, and those clearly have mitochondrial and prosomal implications. So the tumor being twice as heavy and large as hydrogen, it's less subject to quantum effects in bulk water. And obviously, we are now moving to the interfacial water phase just to see how these uh, phenomena are affected by interfacial structured water, where we know the isotope effects of, of um, deuterium are multiplied or magnified or, you know, are larger by, by magnitudes. And here comes the nutritional implications and food type and source simply. What is this, what is the deuterium content of the food that we eat? Uh, carbohydrates versus fat. We know fat is low uh, for uh, biochemical reasons. Fatty acids can only be synthesized from citric acid. Citric acid is an intermediate of uh, the TC cycle or mitochondrial or TC cycle processes, so it's always the tumor depleted because uh, nanomotors and mitochondrial membranes are uh, able to filter uh, to nature several layers there are, and there's a heavy deuterium discrimination and filtering process in living systems. But practically, by food, we can actually alter the deuterium content of our mitochondrial matrix. And because of the mitochondrial matrix, have these uh, interference or these interactions with uh, uh, non-confined water, uh, then uh, we know that practically deuterium, besides other effects, it also affects uh, the quantum destabilization of water and practically water recycling through these mechanisms. Um, so the consequence of that DTO is that less destabilized uh, uh, protons there are than in, in light water and when these uh, two different uh, isotopes of hydrogen are sque squeezed between two hydrophobic surfaces like in cell, uh, mem between cell membranes like in mitochondria, uh, there are clinical and translation of medical um, innuendos. Um, and, and this is what, this is what I'm, I'm, I'm up to now to collaborate with these guys. And we, we started discussing um, these scenarios. Uh, we gave them a, a, a huge push as far as, because uh, they didn't have a medicine or biochemistry like myself. So we just uh, kind of happened to, uh, to use the, their system and their great uh, experimental approach. Uh, to clarify some questions, so we started experiments where we're going to explore uh, how the uh, DTO and H2O um, uh, uh, different so solutions in the physio physiological range uh, in structured water or protonated water would actually uh, affect this uh, uh, quantum destabilization of uh, protons and water and how that would affect uh, mitochondrial functions. Uh, and we're going to write a paper very soon about this, um, and I'm going to tell you what editorial platforms there are now for uh, deuterium um, and, and light water physiology and biochemistry, but um, the practically near quant nuclear quantum effects, this is how we call them, in water rise due to delocalization, zero point energy, and quantum tunneling of protons. I want to cover some of the, the quantum physics of it so you understand. Um, as uh, much as uh, necessary to incorporate this knowledge into your um, everyday thinking. Now, whereas quantum tunneling is significant only at low temperatures, we know that practically, you know, close to absolute zero temperatures, protons slow down, they stick together, they start pushing each other, so uh, a quantum tunneling is significant. It's not as significant in bulk conditions, however, Zero point energy and delocalization of protons are very alerting and very intense, even at uh, uh, normal temperature and pressure. 
giving rise to isotope effects. The first example is the magnetic resonance imaging. We all know what it is. We actually put uh, hydrogen and protons and vacuum molecules in a ma strong magnetic field. We apply a radio frequency, and this radio frequency would actually move these hydrogens or protons out of the magnetic field. Without touching them, actually, we can move them. This is what we call delocalization of protons. And by when we turn off the radio frequency, these protons return uh, to the lattice or to the to the matrix, and that's practically the energy range that we capture uh, for MRI imaging. Um, and we know that the zero point energy range in quantum vacuum or quantum vacuum is uh, uh, very significant or can be measured in, uh, in uh, normal physiological or normal temperature and pressure. And this is practically how deuterium disappeared. It does not disappear, it just kind of changes, uh, uh, it, it, it just changes its form. It, it does not have many physics, you know, it doesn't have a mass anymore, but it has a, a wave uh, nature practically. So switching deuterium, uh, with hydrogen, this effect, this phenomenon does not exist or not as intense as with uh, protons. So practically this zero point energy and quantum vacuum is very important part of understanding mitochondrial functions. Now, just to actually elaborate on this a little bit more, uh, protons can be thought of not as isolated particles but fluctuating fields whose quanta are fermions, those can be leptons or quarks, and force fields whose quanta are protons and gluons. So practically, our waveforms can be actually wrapped into a, a proton that has a mass for uh, certain condensed energy states, yet it can be also uh, returned to its uh, waveform, and that's what's happening in mitochondria we wave, or those nanoconfinements, which can be actually part of this uh, this uh, f uh, phenomenon after all. So we are uh, working on this with these investigators to see how these forces are influenced with uh, uh, in structured water and uh, when we have data, we're definitely gonna share uh, the data with you um, at, at, a next, at a meeting uh, uh, in the future. Now, protons can fluctuate as such between hydrophobic surfaces. The results highlight that uh, the inclusions of proton quantum effects in molecular simulations should yield a better understanding on inner molecular surface phenomena in uh, nanofluids, aquatic chemistry, biology, and medicine. So even these investigators realize, recognize the importance of these phase changes of protons. So they are extending this into the um, uh, physics and biology uh, arena, and we are going to uh, find hopefully uh, medical or medicinal applications. Now this is a mitochondria um, and this is just a somatic uh, scheme of, of, of how mitochondria look like. Here you see the inner membrane space, this is the mitochondrial matrix and these are the proton transferring uh, um, uh, nanomotors and this water in the matrix, especially at certain locations, is very protonated uh, you can see the porins, which actually can transfer water, and uh, there's a, a great deal of uh, size and morphology and uh, lipid uh, nanoconfinements of protons. Now, this is a muscle cell uh, mitochondria. You can see the um, membranes as they are folding up, and uh, if you look at the, the membrane structure and the distances of these hydrophobic uh, uh, membranes, lipid membranes, what you can see here, they are in this uh, nanometer range, and uh, this is where actually water uh, and protons and, 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 and oxygen inter interact with the, these nanoconfinement physics uh, pro properties of uh, physical uh, uh, compartments. And practically, when you look at these uh, scales and we look at these morphology, then you can tell by, morpho by mitochondrial morphology what these uh, distances are and what these uh, um, uh, <coughs> nanoconfinements are. And practically when we look at mitochondria, and this is a neutron scattering, inelastic, incoherent neutron scattering study uh, from uh, Dr. Rafa and his team. Uh, this was published, this is from the um, Department of Physics uh, in Manchester, in the United States. And this is what, what they said, they, what they found, it's that uh, 
uh, exploiting these estimates of interfacial water back to the cell, it becomes clear that the large portion of the cytoplasmic water will behave differently than bulk water. In the nucleus of eukaryote cells, where DNA and protein levels are very high, it can be predicted that the majority of the water molecules will be perturbed, meaning that these are interfacial water layers or solvent sol solvation shells. And the same they found in mitochondria, the overall hydrophobic lipid membrane bound protein concentration is estimated to be about 560 milligrams per milliliter, a level that is equivalent with that found in protein crystals, suggesting that almost all water molecules would be perturbed or structured in mitochondria. So these are actually physical, these are actually modeling and measurements based on the structure that we, um, that we uh, know from, from mitochondrial morphological studies. So practically what we're trying to do and understand is how mitochondria and the hydrophobic membranes deal with proton and, and uh, uh, these uh, changes in, in uh, physical characteristics in proton and how uh, protons and hydroxy groups are formed based on these uh, interactions uh, between membranes and, and uh, isotopes of hydrogen in the mitochondria. Um, the, uh, the, an, another characteristic of, of matrix water is that as constantly protons are entering the matrix, uh, there is a common name for, for the, ex, the, aqua, the, the water cation, it's called oxonium, and for example, the zondo cation is two, two water molecules can form this uh, positively charged zondo cations and a hydroxyl group, and this is how it looks like, for example, this is oxygen-oxygen, uh, and these are protons around them, so uh, each water molecule is, is joined by a, a proton, and when you look at the eigenkation, which is a uh, which is a larger structure, practically you can see the orientation of oxygen and and oxygen atoms and and protons, and you can see the likelihood of, of positioning the the next interference or interaction with protons. So practically, these complexes make uh, water more structured. Ba breaking these hydrogen bonds between water molecules have different energetical scales. When we actually have a deuterium substitution in these complexes, they actually have uh, magnified these, uh, uh, these uh, chemical forces that are necessary to break water molecules. So practically, deuterium makes water more structures in mitochondria. And as a result of that, um, it, these complexes in mitochondria makes it water. They also come into question and also come into uh, uh, scrutiny to find out how they affect mitochondrial functions. Now, Obviously, we are carrying out studies now with these collaborators at the University of uh, uh, Southern California and also with the University of uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia um, in Tuas, simply just to see it's, if, if this really true, uh, one of the mecha mechanisms how deuterium interferes with mitochondrial functions. It, all, it comes with protonated water or, or, or water that has excess protons, and it comes in structural or interfacial water uh, close to membranes and yet proteins and membranes and obviously the, uh, 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 the hydrophobic membranes and their interaction with protons, this uh, quantum destabilization is also a very important uh, aspect of our studies. So um, I'm just going to give you a few um, kind of insights of how deuterium or deuteronomics is uh, kind of uh, uh, evolving in, in the United States. The Americans, they like to create contents using short vocabulary. So now there's a, a word deuteronomics, which is the science of autom uh, autonomic deuterium discrimination in nature. We know deuterium is always um, uh, discriminated from hydrogen, practically because they have a different characteristics, physical characteristics. And uh, depletion now is practically deuterium depletion. They just use one word for it now. And the augmentation is practically deuterium augmentation. And depleted water is practically deuterium depleted water. So this is kind of more like a slangy explanations or slangy kind of approach to deuteronomics or deuterium uh, biochemistry and physiology, which is coming very strong in the United States. And I'm going to cover it just a little bit of that aspect. Um, uh, how are we doing on time? Yeah, well, uh, you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Okay, thank you so much. So, um, so practically, um, so I, I'm, I'm, I, I'd like to... Questions. 
Huh? With the questions. Okay, all right, thank you. So, um, <laughs> so now I, I'd like to update you on the editorial work that uh, we are doing, uh, partially with Gabor. Uh, Nature Scientific Reports now have an editor, uh, it's me, actually, uh, who is actually <laughs> managing the biological physics uh, part of, uh, of um, uh, mitochondrial functions, and uh, which I covered in this talk. Um, and my profile, my editorial profile, uh, in details, it's biochemical translation and clinical interpretations of positional inter inner molecule stable isotope distributions, discrimination and fractionation patterns in pro and eukaryotic cells, the tumor depleting mitochondrial proton tunneling processes, ATP synthase, malate dehydrogenase for the co-regulation of TC cycle flux, and energy production, the tumor as an oncoisotope, metabolic water production in per peroxisomes, mitochondria with emphasis on nutritional and metabolic ketosis for intercellular compartmentalized interfacial bound and free bulk water chemistry, biological process of processing of the tumor, deuteronomics. So practically they took it. So Nature now has an editorial site, which actually you can come with your paper, or you can submit your paper, and actually you have an editor who can actually handle or organize or arrange for reviews in the arena. And uh, it's not only Nature, but now Molecules, which is a Swiss journal, um, has a special issue on medicinal biochemistry of lithium discrimination. Uh, Molecules is the leading international peer-reviewed open access journal of chemistry and it's actually part of the Swiss Chemical Society. So uh, these are really good publication opportunities or platforms and they just gave me a, a few deals that I, I'd like to cover. Um, the 4DDB conference, so you guys who participate in this conference, uh, uh, you attend this conference, will receive a 200 uh, Swiss franc uh, discount. I'm not sure about the exchange rate between the American dollars and the square, but I think the Swiss uh, uh, franc is, is, is still uh, whole, 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 it's a lot more valuable than dollars, but yet, well, not a lot more, but somewhat. So actually, article process, they're going to waive, if you participate in this conference, they're going to waive 200 uh, Swiss francs uh, from article processing charges, and expert contributors submitting to deuteronomics to my I'm the editor of chief of the special issue. Uh, the, actually, they're going to have the full open access article process, processing charge, which is about 1,800 uh, Swiss uh, francs, francs. Now, there's a catch to it, though. Uh, uh, the contributor uh, should be from Europe or the North America. I didn't set these rules, so don't you know blame me for these. The editor did. Uh, you know, she's the section managing yeah. editor, section managing editor molecules. Uh, uh, the, the investigator has to have more than 2,500 citations in the field of literature, and, and the investigator's Hirsch factor has to be 30 or higher. Um, so, how many of us could maybe, well, we'll figure it out, yeah. So, actually, this is a good option because we can save a, you know, a little bit of money, we can arrange for reviews. Submission deadline is 15 November 2019. Actually, well, there's one paper ready that was submitted, and I thank my colleagues who did submit papers. Uh, one paper, the editor-in-chief notified me uh, to Molecules, and uh, what's really interesting is that now there are citations of the genomics or the team related uh, literature. Uh, one is uh, from uh, the University of Pittsburgh. It's a big clinical study. It's a temporal characterization of serum metabolite signatures in lung cancer patients undergoing treatment. Because what they observed is that uh, practically is from Dr. Valley. He's a he's a very prominent investigator in the United States. Uh, one possible because what they found is actually patients who had more higher uh, lipids in their blood, uh, they actually live longer. In, if they had lung cancer. So practically it's a deuterium depleting phenomenon for mitochondria. So one possible, and this is from the discussion of the paper. Uh, we are not authors, so I, I, I'd like to emphasize that we have nothing to do with this paper. We have published uh, regarding biochemistry of deuterium discrimination and they cited our papers. Uh, one possible explanation for the segregation of metabolite pools between those, pro those prognostic for survival and those indicative of progression may lie compartmentalization of biochemical processing and possible mitochondrial dysfunction. So practically they go for this uh, mechanistic approach that we have been emphasizing for a long time. 
Metabolites from our study related to survival are long chain fatty acid alcohols, which may result from oxidative processing in proxosome or from dietary sources. These are ketogenic substrates which are lower in detuned content. So practically they are incorporating the metabolic water scenario in their clinical decisions or clinical reasoning uh, of uh, cancer survival. And there's a, a very recent paper from the Basel, from Switzerland, from the Basel uh, Children's Hospital, Basel Children's Hospital, and it's actually called Personalized Treatment Response Assessment for Rare Childhood Tumors, tum tumors Using Microcalorimetry micro Exemplified by Use of Carbonic Anhydrase and Aquaporin 1 Inhibitors. So what they showed, that if they actually inhibit the influx of extracellular hydrogen water into the cells, then actually it has a therapeutic benefit uh, in these uh, rare tumors. And uh, actually, this is also from the, from the discussions that uh, they say that Borch and Dr. Shomier they brought these papers together with Gabor and with some other investigators. Borch et al. have proposed that mechanisms, mechanisms similar to the inhibition of carbonic anhydrase can inhibit growth of tumor cells by limiting uptake of deteriorated water into cells. And practically, these authors further suggest that these mechanisms might result in multiple changes of translational impact. Translational impact meant, means that it can be actually used in the clinics. It can be used in clinical decisions. It can be used as a, as a, a part of uh, evidence-based medicine. And uh, I'd like to update you on a few studies that we are currently carrying out at UCLA. As I was mentioning, Dr. Todd Pascal, uh, team, uh, his team, uh, Todd's team at, at the University of, of, of uh, San Diego with Dr. Mishra of Saudi Arabia, they just started working on these uh, quantum destabilization of water based on mitochondrial structured membranes or these uh, protonated uh, structured water and quantum destabilization uh, in their, in their um, uh, system, experimental system. We are advising them what type of, uh, of how to whip the water in shape uh, to actually behave uh, in a structural fashion, uh, how to actually show the nutritional based uh, variations uh, in these structured water compartment as far as uh, forces of of uh, uh, <coughs> destabilization, quantum destabilization of water goes. And Dr. Rehan, who is my colleague at UCLA, Harvard UCLA, he runs the pediatrics neonatology. You know, these are the, the very um, kind of uh, um, the vulnerable babies to oxygen damage because they are actually stillbirth. They are low birth weight babies. Uh, birth, they were born uh, somewhere between 30, up to 30, 32 weeks. So their lung function is not very, very good. Practically, they have to be put on a uh, respirator, and they start ventilating these babies with positive pressure ventilators. And as a result of that, they have this bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and it seems that depletion rescues their, their lung cells. So the new depletion is becoming a very, in the, in the United States and at UCLA, uh, it's becoming a experimental, clinically very well positioned effort. Uh, I'm hoping that from this study, from Dr. Rehan's study, now he's repeating his studies on primary um, alveolar cells, which are packed with pneumocytes. Uh, I believe that the, he, this study will be completed before Christmas time, so we're going to have some more convincing data and more translational data for clinical studies. And we're definitely going to run a clinical blind, a double blinded randomized study with these babies. But actually, it's coming uh, all together. And uh, I thank Gabor for being able to provide us a, a pharmaceutical grade, good manufacturing practice. It's not available from anywhere else. But uh, soon enough, we are probably going to discuss these studies, how to approach uh, from the clinical translational point of view. I'm also part of the UCLA uh, Clinical Translational Research Institute. So I can uh, help these efforts uh, um, quite, quite a bit. Um, so um, I, I just thank Gabor to be such a uh, um, kind of a, uh, undisturbable or, or undeferable, um, you know, uh, just uh, Investigator in the in the uh, tumor depletion field. This is fumarate hydratase, the enzyme that recycles water in the TCA cycle. If this enzyme is mutated, definitely gonna uh, 
uh, the, those patients develop very aggressive cancers. I thank the UCLA School of Medicine, Los Angeles and uh, Endocrinology, Endocrinology Metabolism, the Lundquist Institute. Um, we actually have uh, 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 um, organizations that work with us. And uh, uh, this is my website, lithogbros.com, where actually all these degenerative phenomenon are more emphasized from the clinical position point of view. And with that, I just want to thank you for your time.